back to another episode of Sneedcast Industry Update, the series that keeps you updated with our ever-changing industry. For those of you that have been watching the series for a while now, you know how this goes, but for those that are new, welcome. We'll be covering the latest in manufacturing, packaging, coding, sustainability, and much more. I'm your host, Alexa, and today we'll be discussing topics ranging from prices getting spicy for sriracha, temptation in the checkout lane, innovating the guacamole making process, and flying cars being within our So, rate. getting started. Inflation has affected everything from the used car market to the housing market to the price of gas and much more. But how far is too far? Well, that depends. How much do you love sriracha? Hai Fung Food Sriracha, the beloved red hot sauce packaged in those green capped bottles, is becoming harder to find these days, and the company is pointing fingers at a scarcity of chili peppers over the last couple of years. And as frustrated fans continue to miss Hai Fung Sriracha, third party resellers are taking advantage and punching up those prices. What used to be a $5 or even $10 bottle now sells for shocking amounts in listings posted by Amazon, eBay, Walmart, and others. For instance, an eBay ad for a single 17 ounce bottle of Sriracha stretched from around $20 to as much as $150. This is surprising seeing as though other hot sauce brands don't appear to be experiencing the same level of supply troubles. Hai Feng told the Associated Press that it continues to be troubled by shortages of raw materials, which is similar to last year's scarcity when the company had to temporarily suspend sales of its sriracha sauce and other popular products. Hai Feng said that limited production resumed recently, although the California company didn't specify by how much or provide an estimate of when it believes suppliers will be able to deliver an adequate number of peppers. Why is there a Hai Feng sriracha shortage when other brands are not experiencing the same problem? There's speculation on what's truly causing the shortage. Some experts believe that climate change is partially responsible seeing as though weather shifts and droughts have been affecting Mexico and the U.S. Southwest. These areas are where Hai Feng sources its chile peppers. David Ortega, a food economist and associate professor at Michigan State University said, the main culprit here is a shortage of their primary ingredient, the red jalapeno chile pepper, and that's due to climate change and mega drought. While climate change has impacted agriculture, it's definitely not the only culprit. At least that's what extension vegetable specialist and New Mexico professor Stephanie Walker said. Walker believes that Hai Feng may not have enough suppliers with different farms and could be looking to build relationships with new growers. Like Walker says, it really does come down to relationships that individual processors have with their grower base. Where does Hai Feng source its chile peppers from? Currently, the sriracha sauce is made up of peppers from various farms in New Mexico, Mexico, and California. But for nearly 30 years, Fung's sole supplier was California-based Underwood Ranches. However, the partnerships collapsed back in 2017 following a financial dispute that ended when Hai Fung breached his contract and committed fraud, which ultimately led to Underwood receiving $23.3 million in compensation. Craig Underwood, the owner of Underwood Ranches, believes that Hai Fung shortage was due to the owner not having rebuilt his supply chain properly. While available supplies and climate change may be contributing factors to skyrocketing prices, there's also consumer behavior at play. In this case, we're referring to hoarding. The panic around potentially losing access to a desired product leads many people to buy more than they would typically need. For instance, at the beginning of COVID, people were going absolutely feral for toilet paper and water. While sriracha may be hard to find and replacing a supplier or pepper may be quite time consuming, we're sure that high fung sriracha will make a comeback for the consumers in no time. Temptation, temptation, temptation. Let's face it, we've all been there, waiting in a line at a store checkout surrounded by unhealthy snacks and drinks. In fact, according to researchers at the University of California, Davis, around 70% of foods and beverages at checkout are unhealthy. In addition, an even higher percentage of snack size options were considered unhealthy at 89%. A study published in the current Developments and Nutrition Journal suggests that most food and beverage options at checkout consist of 31% candy, 11% sweetened beverages, 9% salty snacks, 6% sweets, and if you were looking for healthy options at checkout, then you might be disappointed to realize that only 3% are water, 2% are nuts and seeds, 1% are fruits and vegetables, 0.1% are legumes, and 0.02% are milk. The checkout lane is prime real estate in the supermarket industry because it is the only place in a store where every consumer must pass through, and it's known to contribute to impulse purchases. This isn't just speculation. Jennifer Falb, associate professor with the Department of Human Ecology, conducted a study regarding the consumable goods found within the checkout area. Falb says, the checkout lane has been designed this way through marketing agreements in which food and beverage companies pay stores to place their products, which are most unhealthy, at checkout. In the city of Berkeley, an ordinance went into effect requiring large food stores to offer more nutritious offerings at the checkout. This ordinance led to Berkeley becoming the first city in the U.S. to implement a health checkout policy. 
Falb said Berkeley's policy is consistent with federal dietary guidelines that emphasize consuming nutrient-dense foods such as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, and cutting back on sodium and added sugars. Unhealthy snacks and beverages have held their natural spot at the checkout lanes for the longest, so you can understand why this ordinance has shaken up the norm. According to Falb, Berkeley's checkout policy allows certain foods and beverage categories at checkout and sets limits on the amount of added sugar and sodium in a product at checkout. Shoppers can still get candy from the candy aisle, but it won't be pushed on them at checkout. Researchers also found that the percentage of food and beverage options that met healthy checkout standards was highest in chain specialty food stores, chain supermarkets, and chain mass merchandisers. It was lowest in chain dollar stores and independent grocery stores, which are most common in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Falb also goes on to add that checkout areas can strongly influence consumer choices and hopes that these findings can be used to help improve the food environment for people across all neighborhoods. While current consumers may lack healthy options at checkout for the moment, there's definitely an opportunity for checkout to offer healthier options. In the coming years, we're sure to see checkout lane snacks change, so enjoy it while it lasts. Can you have extra guac with that? A phrase uttered so effortlessly, yet making a big bowl of guacamole is more time-consuming than any of us could imagine. Before you can enjoy this avocado-based dip, someone has to core, peel, and slice the avocados. However, with so many innovations out on the market, the process is about to become so much simpler. Chipotle workers are especially happy seeing as though a robot by the name of Avocado is currently being put to the test. Avocado is a prototype avocado processing robot that handles the time-consuming prep work before a Chipotle employee mashes the avocados by hand. The machine, which can hold up to 25 pounds of avocados, has the potential to cut the prep time needed to prep a batch of guacamole in half. Not only is avocado helping to cut down prep times, but it's also helping to reduce workplace injuries, which occur a lot more than we think. At the height of the avocado toast era, several media outlets reported an uptick in avocado hand injuries. According to OSF Healthcare, avocado cutting related injuries send about 9,000 people to the emergency room each year. The avocado robot is getting better and better, seeing as though it not only helps reduce injuries, but also food waste. This couldn't come at a better time since Chipotle estimates its restaurants across the US, Canada, and Europe going through 100 million pounds of avocados this year. Vibu and Chipotle partnered to build Avocado, and there's even been mention of introducing AI to Avocado to lead to even more efficiency and waste reduction. Chipotle has been one of the chain restaurants at the forefront of improving the kitchen through automation. In 2022, Chipotle began testing a robotic assembly line for building burritos under the counter while employees work above. The automated kitchen assistant is still in testing, but Chippy will surely be a great addition once it's integrated. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's actually a flying car. That's right, the future is closer than ever as the FAA clears ASCA's flying car. ASCA A5 is the world's first flying car to start the type certification process with the FAA. The Silicon Valley Air Mobility Company's prototype was awarded a Certification of Authorization, also known as a COA, and Special Airworthiness Certification by the FAA and has now started flight testing. Since 2022, ASCA began performing successful ground testing and then in quarter one of 2023, ASCA began conducting on-street driving tests. ASCA A5 has successfully met all FAA safety requirements and they can prove it with their special airworthiness certificate. They're currently working with the FAA to earn their type certification. A type certification signifies that the design complies with applicable airworthiness, noise, fuel, venting, and exhaust emission standards. Guy Kaplinsky, the CEO and co-founder of ASCA says, the data we're harvesting from flight testing is enabling us to make progress toward our type certification. We already completed the initial phase and are progressing towards our next milestone, our G1 status. G1 basis is a critical milestone in the FAA cross-validation process, establishing airworthiness and environmental requirement necessary to achieve FAA type certification validation. We've learned a little bit about the different types of certifications, but now it's time to dive into the ASCA A5. It's roughly the size of an SUV. The four-seater ASCA A5 is a drive-and-fly EVOTL that can travel by road and air. What are some of the features that make the A5 one of the safest hybrid vehicles out there? The A5 has a dual hybrid energy supply with batteries and a range extender engine that charges the batteries in flight. It also uses premium gasoline from standard gas stations. It also has large aerodynamic wings that are optimized for safe landing with the ability to glide. Six independent motor systems for flight, sufficient reserve flight time to meet the FAA safety requirements, ballistic parachutes, and these are just to name a couple of features that make the A5 one of the safest hybrid vehicles out there. 
Mackie Kaplinski, the co-founder, chair, and COO of ASCA goes on to say, one of the significant advantages of a roadworthy EVOTL like the ASCA A5 is that it does not require modification or electrification of existing airports since it can maximize the use of today's infrastructure, such as many charging stations located around us. At the moment, the ASCA A5 is not only capable of vertical takeoff and landing from a helipad or vertiport, it can enter an airfield by driving through the airport gate, open the wings, taxi toward a helipad or runway, then take off. We might not have cities floating in the sky or futuristic escapes made entirely of chrome, but the ASCA A5 makes the maximum use of existing infrastructure such as parking, charging stations, airfields, helipads, and runways for a seamless integration into city and suburban landscapes. We're sure that in a couple of years, commutes are going to be looking a lot different, and hopefully that includes those of us that take I-45 North here in Houston. The nation held its breath as UPS workers' demand for higher pay and better benefits, especially for part-time workers, threatened a potential strike. Teamsters Union, the workers' union, voiced concerns about the wage gap between part-time and full-time employees, citing inadequate benefits and earnings for part-time staff. In response, negotiations ensued, leading to a new agreement that promises to raise existing part-time workers paid at $21 an hour and offers an average of $49 an hour for full-time employees. With a looming deadline on August 1st, the shipping giant and Teamsters successfully reached a deal on July 25th. The agreement is currently being voted on from August 3rd to August 22nd. As businesses across the nation anxiously await the outcome, the hope remains that a strike will be averted, ensuring the continuation of a smooth flow of products and services. So now that we know a little bit more about the UPS situation, we actually have Tom Anderson, our National Account Manager, and we have our VP of Sales and Marketing, Ken. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So Tom, we're going to be starting off with you. Since you do work closely with all of our small to medium-sized businesses, did you hear any kind of concerns or discussions regarding the whole UPS strike? Yeah, you know, on occasion you used to hear some feedback about the, the, the strike and UPS. Uh, uh, with small and medium-sized businesses, there's always a concern about logistics if you have an, alter, you know, an alter, alternative uh, way to get goods and everything to them and, and from them. A lot of times I'd see them mention that they were very concerned and then they were they prepared for it. And that was probably their biggest concern because uh, as a small, medium-sized business, you don't always think about a strike. You don't always want to actually even want to worry about a strike, but there was concern out there and, and, and then the, the concern was for UPS, then the concern was for themselves, and then the concern was how are we going to handle it if the strike does happen? And so a lot of times they were on the, on the brink of, uh, you know, asking what will we do because we have to yeah. get ink to them. We have to get printers to them. And, and uh, a lot of times the question was turned around to the, you know, their, our account managers, what are you going to do about it if it does happen? So it wasn't just on their shoulders, it was on ours as well. Right. And this is something that we don't really take into consideration. Like we never really consider, oh, what could potentially happen if a strike um, occurs or how would it affect us on a business side? Um, but Ken, since you do work more with the business side of Sneed Coding Solutions, um, did we have any concerns or were there any kind of worries that we were dealing with during this whole uh, potential for a strike? Uh, yeah, absolutely. A lot like uh, a lot of similar concerns to what Tom talked about. You know, we're also a small to medium sized business, uh, which I think is why we, we do so well with, with these, um, these other businesses, our customers. But same concerns, UPS is our primary uh, shipping partner for, as it goes for, for shipping things out to our customers. We're an e-commerce business, um, so naturally that is a huge concern for us. Two to three weeks ago, we certainly started having those conversations, uh, having conversations with our actual UPS driver trying to get a little scoop from him, maybe get some inside nuggets, as well as uh, reaching out to our UPS uh, account manager. Our, our logistics team was, was staying on top of that so we could try to, you know, like Tom said, be prepared. What are, what are we gonna do in the event that something like this happens? You know, it's been 25 years since anything remotely close to this has threatened the supply chain. Um, I believe I was reading this morning, <clears throat> potentially the 6% of the US GDP ships uh, via UPS every day. Uh, so that's a pretty big number, a huge effect on the economy. So naturally, you have to, to think about these things. Uh, of course, alternate uh, shippers, uh, FedEx is, is always an option, um, as well as 
UPS had been informing us, of course, they had their own contingency plan in place uh, in the event of a strike that, you know, they'd do everything they can to continue service. So um, certainly everybody is just, pre I think, huge uh, sigh of relief that they were able to come together and, and come up with a solution that, that worked for the business as well as, as for the employees. Right. Um, Tom, I know that you had mentioned that, you know, the weight of the, the strike would have fallen on your shoulders as well. But if we wouldn't have been able to get product out to our uh, small to medium sized businesses, what would that have really meant for these businesses had there been a strike? Well, the, the, and to continue on, as Ken said, that is the fact right. that you gotta, you gotta be prepared. You, you gotta have, and that goes for every business, you know. The large companies, they've got distribution. You know, they've got that luxury of knowing that they've got the big trucks and the flexibility with it but when you're a small and medium-sized business yeah you're like like mentioned dhl fedex and even the uh, united states you know parcel service itself you know it's 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 places they got looked to that they never looked to before established an account really fast and get set up um it it, it was definitely gonna put a, a kink in the wheel and so i think it was um it, it was as serious considerations they had to take you know and then and then well here's another thing when you get talk about the teamsters it's very very strong very very strong uh, union and therefore will there be solidarity amongst other you know uh, packaging or uh, shipping companies and that very well could be you have a lot more power and i mean they got a ton of numbers as far as ups but what if the other ones uh, chimed in then then you're going to have to you're going to have to make a decision to to resolve their differences or resolve their pay increases a lot like we saw with the, the train unions earlier in the summer and and they uh i mean you just can't let that happen and there has to be a decision making they could they could have gotten involved with their brothers and sisters in the shipping world and that could have been uh that could have been really tough for everyone to handle right Ken, um, I know that you did mention that we had a sigh of relief once we knew that there was an agreement on the table, but what would have happened had there not been an agreement? Yeah, of course, you know, we have our, our business is supplying other manufacturers with uh, so much needed supplies uh, for their daily operations, uh, you know, the date coding machines and packaging equipment they use for, for everything that they're shipping out. They, they rely on a continuous supply of, of in-stock goods, so certainly a huge hiccup there. It may have uh, potentially more than likely led to uh, delays you know we probably wouldn't be able to get things to customers as fast as possible again just working with alternate carriers uh, we already have an account with FedEx we would increase obviously our shipments via FedEx and potentially other other avenues as well but uh, when you're looking at the the amount of volume that UPS is responsible for in terms of the entire nation and the entire supply chain uh, that 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 potential strike you know regardless of how prepared you are um, is going to lead to some serious, serious hiccups uh, in terms of delivery times um, all along every supply chain and every business uh, across the country. So, again, just can't express it enough what a huge sigh of relief I think it is for everybody, um, whether it's a small to medium-sized business or, or anybody, just uh, for the sake of the overall economy, it's a, it's a good thing that they were able to get this, get this done. You know, we're happy to hear that an agreement was put on the table. Now we just have between, um, if I remember correctly, between August 3rd until August 22nd, just to make sure that um, workers do have the ability to uh, vote on the agreement that's currently on the table. So fingers crossed and hopefully, you know, everything goes according to plan. Um, but we do want to hear a little bit from Tom and from Ken. Uh, just any additional thoughts on the matter or do you guys feel like we kind of touched on everything? Yeah, I mean that that's it in a nutshell. And and like you said, there's a there is there's a resolve in the problem. And I it, I, it, it sounds like everything's gonna go, you know, smoothly in the future, but it is a lesson to be learned. And and that's as for us and our and our uh, customers and what we have out there, it says you better be prepared. You've always gotta have a backup plan. And mm -hmm. you know, no matter I mean as, as tough of a pill it is to swallow, you're gonna create a relationship and, and like so many of them do there there's a lot of our customers and ourselves that we think of what if as in houston you think about the hurricane you got your backup plan you know so when you're in the you know when you're needing a shipping business on a daily basis 
you know, you, got, you just have to be prepared so that when it does happen, you know, you're going to be ready and uh, it won't be much of a learning curve to resolve the problem again. Thank you for that, Tom. And then, Ken, do you have any additional thoughts on the matter? Yeah, certainly. I think just in general, it's, it's kind of refreshing to see this day and age where you have uh, two parties uh, that, that uh, come to a table and are able to have differences and, and different objectives, different agendas, uh, different motivators, and actually be able to, to talk things through and, and come, up, come to a resolution, regardless of how close they came to the deadline, the fact that they were able to, to sort things out ahead of UPS was able to, to see the value of you know the potential danger too of a strike, what it meant for them 25 years ago, not wanting to go through that again, and, and again, just having reasonable requests and, and be able to talk that through and, and seeing the value of each other. You know, having this, the union understand they need the, the company as much as the company needs the union. Uh, it's been a long time since you've kind of seen some of these types of uh, productive outcomes uh, the last few years, so that's always a refreshing thing to see. Well. Thank you, Tom and Ken, for all of this information. And, you know, we look forward to our next panel discussion here on Sneedcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Take care, guys. Like always, stay tuned for our next episode of Sneedcast Industry Update. And make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that notification bell down below to stay up to date with all of our great content. Follow our social media platforms to see all of our updates as we continue on our Word Coding Everywhere tour and our Behind the Sneeds. Also, let us know what topics you'd like to see us talk about here on the show. We look forward to hearing from you all. Bye, guys.